Hello and welcome back to my channel. This reviewer is about theories of ethics, which is a part of the anthropological and sociological foundations of education. This also serves as a reviewer for the philosophical and ethical foundations of values education for those who have values ed as their majorship. Let's begin with etymology and description of ethics. When we say etymology, we are talking of the origin of the word and the historical development of its meaning. Etymologically, ethics is derived from the Greek word ethikos, or that which pertains to ethos, the English translation of which is custom or character. Ethics is a normative philosophical science that deals with the goodness or badness, the rightness or the wrongness of human acts. To understand this description, let us first look into the words normative philosophical science. The word normative refers to anything that is relating to norms or standards. When we combine the word normative to the word philosophy, which talks about the ultimate causes and principles of reality using the human reason, normative philosophy would then refer to a specific discipline in philosophy that posits the question, what is good and what is bad, or what is right action and what is wrong action. When we combine normative philosophy to the word science, which is a systematized body of knowledge, then the term normative philosophical science would refer to a systematized body of knowledge of ultimate principles reached with the use of human reason that lets us judge whether an act is good or bad, right or wrong. Now we should not forget that in this description of ethics, what is analyzed is human act in contradistinction with acts of man. Human act is an act which proceeds from the deliberate free will of man in contrast to act of man or an act that does not proceed from the deliberate free will of man. To constitute a human act entails the presence of three elements, knowledge, freedom, and voluntariness. Now let us go to the relationship of and distinctions between ethics and morality. Both ethics and morality deal with human act or human conduct. Ethics pertains to the knowledge while morality pertains to the application of this knowledge in the performance of human acts. Ethics equips man with a theoretical knowledge of the morality of human acts. When one does the theories of ethics, one actually performs the theory meaning one is actually doing ethics. This is morality, the praxis of the theory. The actual doing of ethics is termed as morality. Let us now examine the difference between moral philosophy, another term used for ethics, and moral theology. Moral philosophy bases its principles on human reason and experience. It can be a personal experience or others' experience, both contemporary and historical. On the contrary, moral theology bases its principles on divine revelation, on human reason, and experience. The difference is the additional element of divine revelation or God's disclosure of what is right and wrong in moral theology, and not simply the conclusion reached by human reasoning as to what is right and wrong in moral philosophy. To put our discussion in context in the broad subject of ethics, let us briefly explain the different branches of ethics. 
Number one is descriptive or comparative ethics. This branch of ethics describes what people actually believe to be right or wrong and accordingly holds up the human actions either as acceptable or unacceptable. This is also called comparative ethics as it gives a comparison between or among the ethics of different people and times. Under this branch, we can study the ethics of the past and the ethics of the present. It also studies the ethics of different societies. The next branch, which is the focus of this presentation, is called normative or prescriptive ethics. It deals with norms or a set of considerations by which one should act. It is also called prescriptive because it prescribes the theories and principles by which we determine whether an action is right or wrong. Under this branch, there are three categories, virtue ethics, the ontological ethics, and consequential ethics. We will discuss each of them and their respective representatives in a while. The third branch of ethics is applied ethics. This branch deals with the philosophical examination from a moral standpoint of particular issues in private and public life, which are matters of moral judgment. Under this branch, we can study medical ethics, bioethics, legal ethics, business ethics, environmental ethics, information ethics, and media ethics. The last branch is meta-ethics. It deals with the origin of the ethical concepts themselves. It questions what goodness or rightness or morality itself is. It asks the question, what is goodness? What is evilness? And under this branch, one can study about moral realism and moral anti-realism. Let us now zoom in to normative ethics. Normative ethical theories are usually split into three main categories. Virtue ethics, the ontology, and consequentialism. Virtue ethics can be associated with the efforts exerted in a human act, the ontological to the ethical characteristics of the act, and consequential ethics to the impact of the act. Let us first study about virtue ethics. Virtue ethics focuses on one's character and virtues used in determining or evaluating ethical behavior. Plato, Aristotle, and Thomas Aquinas were major advocates or virtue ethics. Plato identifies four cardinal virtues that are necessary for a happy individual and that are necessary for a good society. He also believed that the ideal state should be with people with such virtues. The four cardinal virtues are prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude or courage. Prudence literally means discretion in practical affairs. Prudence is right reason in action. Justice refers to the flawless order by which every human being does his or her own business, the right man in the right place. Temperance refers to an inner strength that protects against excess. It consists of self-regulation and obedience to authority. And fortitude or courage is bravery based on justice. Let us now move to Aristotle and the term eudaimonism. Aristotle originated eudaimonism from two Greek words, eu meaning good, 
and daimon meaning spirit, literally good spirit. It defines the right action as that which leads to well-being and which can be achieved by a lifetime of practicing virtues in one's everyday activities subject to the exercise of practical wisdom. Arete or virtue for Aristotle means the excellence of a thing to perform effectively its proper function. For Aristotle, virtue happens in the context of the mean. He said, virtue then is a state of character concerned with choice lying in a mean. This means that if virtue is a choice, it is therefore an activity in the sense that choice is the original cause of action. So whether it is moral or intellectual virtue, it is always a choice, an activity. In the light of virtue as a choice or an activity, Aristotle puts forward his idea of the mean. Virtue is a mean between two vices. The mean lies between vice in the context of excess and vice in the context of defect. Here is an example of his doctrine of the mean wherein the virtuous act lies in the middle. This is similar to the Latin saying that goes, Virtus in medio estat. The virtuous acts in the different sample social settings are the ones under mean. In danger, it is virtuous to be courageous. In self-expression, to be truthful. In social relations, to be friendly. And in many matters, to be thrifty. We now go to another representative of virtue ethics, Thomas Aquinas. For Thomas Aquinas, man is more than a composite of body and soul. He is nothing less than elevated to a supernatural order which participates, as far as a creature can, in the very nature of God. A person in the state of grace possesses certain enduring powers, the infused virtues and gifts, that make some capable of spiritual actions which others cannot perform. Infused virtues include the strictly supernatural theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, and the moral virtues of prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude, or what Plato called before as cardinal virtues. Again, under normative ethics, we also have the ontology. The ontology is an approach to ethics that focuses on the rightness or wrongness of actions themselves. It argues that decisions should be made considering the factors of one's duties and others' rights. The Greek deon means obligation or duty. One deontological theory is the divine command theory. William of Ockham's Divine Command Theory states that an action is right if God has decreed that it is right, and that an act is obligatory if and only if and because it is commanded by God. For William of Ockham, the will is not a blind faculty. It operates through the mediation of right reason, though it needs not follow its dictates. The will is free. In order to act properly, therefore, an agent must try to be the sort of person who wills what God wants him to will, precisely because he knows God wills him to will it. It's Another deontology theory is the natural rights theory. Natural rights theory is espoused by Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. This holds that humans have absolute natural rights in the sense of universal rights that are inherent in the nature of ethics 
and not contingent on human actions or beliefs. This eventually developed into what we today call as human rights. The next deontological theory is called categorical imperative. Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative roots morality in humanity's rational capacity and asserts certain inviolable moral laws. He contends that it is the intention behind our acts that matters and not the consequences our acts bear. In this thread of thought, Kant claims that the motive in moral acts cannot be happiness, pleasure, God, or religion, but duty. The measure of the good motive or will or intention is in the context of duty. In Kantian ethical school, man acts morally because it is his duty to be moral. The moral duty according to Kant is a duty of man because of his respect for the moral law. According to Kant, the moral law on duty is a categorical or an absolute command. That is why he calls his brand of morality categorical imperative. For Kant, to live a moral life is to live in accordance with the laws of reason. Kant argues that this command is true, valid, and binding because it is beyond experience. Since morality for Kant is a priori, therefore the command to live a moral life of obeying the laws of reason is a must. Kant contends that the moral law is determined by our rational capacities. In other words, man as a rational being imposes the moral law upon himself. This implies that the moral law is man's own creation not God's. Still under the ontology, there is also what is called as pluralistic deontology. Pluralistic deontology is a description of the deontological ethics propounded by W.D. Ross. He argues that there are seven prima facie duties which need to be taken into consideration when deciding on which duty should be acted upon. Beneficence to help others improve their character. Non-maleficence to avoid harming other people. Justice to ensure people get what they deserve. Self-improvement to improve ourselves. Reparation to recompense someone if you have acted wrongly towards them. Gratitude to benefit people who have benefited us and promise keeping to act according to explicit and implicit promises including the implicit promise to tell the truth. In some circumstances, there may be clashes or conflicts between these duties and a decision must be made whereby one duty may trump another, although there are no hard and fast rules and no fixed order of significance. Let us now move on to consequentialism, also called as teleological ethics, from the Greek word telos, meaning result, and purpose, goal, or impact. Consequentialism or teleological ethics argues that the morality of an action is contingent or dependent on the action's outcome or result. Thus, a morally right action is the one that produces a good outcome or consequence. One famous consequentialist theory is utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is from the Latin adjective utilis, meaning useful. The origins of utilitarianism can be traced back as far as the Greek philosopher Epicurus, but its full formulation is usually credited to Jeremy Bentham, 
with John Stuart Mill as its foremost proponent. Utilitarian ethics, in general, is a kind of ethical theory that advocates the idea that human happiness is the measure of goodness. Happiness here is defined as the maximization of pleasure and the minimization of pain. There are two kinds of utilitarianism, psychological hedonism and egoistic hedonism. Psychological hedonism, from the Greek hedone meaning pleasure, is the philosophy that considers pleasure as the most important pursuit of humanity. Its contention is that man, by nature, is capable of doing only those actions which give him pleasure and that he avoids those actions that give him pain. Egoistic hedonism, on the other hand, is the contention that man is primarily obligated to seek his own pleasure even if it means the deprivation of others. This is, of course, destructive. For Jeremy Bentham, nature had placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone that we point out what we ought to do, as well as to determine what we shall do. This brand of ethics maintains that man should act in order to produce the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. John Stuart Mill, an avid follower of Jeremy Bentham, noticed that there is a deficiency in Bentham's ethical theory. Mill, recognizing that Bentham focuses only in the quantitative value of pleasure, adds his concept on the qualitative values of pleasure and takes them as the trademark of his ethical theory. For Mill, some pleasures are more valuable than others. For instance, intellectual pleasure is higher in value than physical or sensual pleasure. If Bentham's emphasis is pleasure, Mills is happiness. This seems tantamount to saying that happiness as a quality is higher in degree than pleasure. Mill says that happiness is the most fundamental principle of morality and the source of moral obligation. This leads Mill to introduce his own concept labeled as the greatest happiness to the greatest degree. Another theory under consequentialism is negative consequentialism. It focuses on minimizing bad consequences rather than promoting good consequences. This may actually require active intervention to prevent harm from being done or may only require passive avoidance of bad outcomes. One advocate of negative consequentialism is G.E. Moore. Altruism is another form of consequentialism. Altruism from the Italian altrui, or the Latin alteri meaning other, prescribes that an individual should take actions that have the best consequences for everyone except for himself. Thus, individuals have a moral obligation to help, serve, or benefit others, if necessary, at the sacrifice of self-interest. Altruism is the principle and moral practice of concern for happiness of other human beings resulting in a quality of life, both material and spiritual. Most, if not all, of the world's religions promote altruism as a very important moral value. Buddhism, Jainism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Sikhism, Hinduism. Thomas Nagel's concept of altruism 
is a definite cure of a disease called selfishness, egoism, solipsism, or any theory that firmly embraces the self or the ego as its beholder's only interest, preoccupation, and concern. In this world of exaggerated or heightened materialism, it is always easy to lose oneself in the eddy of selfishness and self-centeredness. But here is Nagel's appeal to all of us to go back to the fold of our responsibility to others. Thank you very much for watching and see you on my next videos.